That's why this engine's white. You could paint it yellow, you could paint it purple, you could paint it green, I don't care. Mine stayed Matterhorn white. As far as I'm concerned, that is excellent projection right there. What's up guys, FSC Speed Shop. This is a different video than I usually do on this channel. I try to be a little bit more entertaining than on this video. I don't really like to do a lot of how-to videos, especially if there are much better ones out there. I'll give a shout out to a very good YouTuber. He's also a professional Caterpillar diesel mechanic. Link is in the description below along right here. They call him Adept 8. He's a Caterpillar diesel mechanic and I've looked through his library of information and let me tell you, uh, shout out to Adept Ape, he did a really good job on a bunch of videos that actually helped to spur me on to have the confidence to do this engine. Now yes, I've done other automobile engines in the past and I've worked smaller jobs on other engines very similar to this. This is not my first Caterpillar. In fact, this is my third. But I've never gone ahead and rebuilt completely stem to stern a Caterpillar diesel engine. I've done many automotive ones in the past, but this is the first here. A lot of the techniques apply and they're a little bit more picky and a little bit more in depth in the detail. Let me tell you, they say the devil is in the details. In this engine, absolutely it is. There's a myriad of ways you can mess one up. The purpose of this video is to show what they talk about when they're dealing with the liner projection and dealing with the counter bore. This particular engine here is in my 1984 Peterbilt 362 cab over. You see the steps here behind me. I already lifted the cab up at about a 45 angle, got it sitting on a safety catch, and we're going to get ahead and do liner projection. This is a 1984 Peterbilt, as I said earlier. And this is a 3406B Caterpillar engine. I believe about the 400 horsepower range. I'm not sure on that. This truck has an interesting pedigree. It started life as a company truck, apparently for keen transport. It was driven by one driver by the name of David Line. He later bought the truck from Keen, and then eventually it wound up leased on to daily transportation. The way I understand it is Mr. Line had gotten sick and stopped driving and held onto the truck for a considerable amount of time. But before he got sick, the engine was in frame. After the time he had in framed it, he got sick and quit driving. He held onto it for a very long time. The truck was later purchased by a guy in Newcastle, Delaware. I believe he ran some kind of a hot rod shop and he did a couple other odd and end things. He bought the truck, he was gonna pull a dump trailer and I think a Landall with it and he decided against doing anything with it, he sold it to me. And to be honest, he sold it to me for a very fair price. So the way I was looking at it was I had a fresh engine, albeit a very older rebuild, but a rebuild nonetheless. The truck did not have a lot of miles on it. The truck, as of now, still doesn't even have a million miles on it. But yet here we are again with the engine completely torn down. Well, after I had replaced all the tires, brakes, majority of the air and fuel hoses, I went at a new windshield and so forth, put a headache rack on it and got it all set up ready to go. I ran the truck hard for about three months, didn't have any issues with it, but right before Christmas I had a very major issue with it. I woke up cold, It was I was taking a nap and it was idling and I woke up cold, I turned the heater up and it didn't heat me. I'm like what the heck's going on? So I left the rest area I was at and I got to the next truck stop 13 miles away. As soon as I left I seen what the problem was. I had 200 degree water sitting still, but yet the heater core was cold. Obviously the pump isn't pumping properly and it got and it got a little warm. I managed to make it to the next truck stop, dropped five gallons of antifreeze in it. Granted it was 16 degrees outside, I didn't want to make any ice in the radiator, so I put antifreeze in it. It took five gallons to fill it. Now where's the water going? Well that became another problem that to this day I never managed to solve. And it wasn't for lack of trying. Ultimately, I limped it home from Pennsylvania here to Freedom, Wisconsin. It sucked up nine gallons of water and it did have a considerable oil leak to it, which probably is what saved me. The fact it was leaking oil and a now thin oil because the water was going into the oil, water was dripping out the blow-by tube from where it was steaming into the engine, condensating up into the top of the valve covers and into the blow-by tube. Water was dripping out the blow-by tube. It was very obvious. It had that milky color all up in the top of the valve covers, and it was just pretty nasty. But as far as I was told by other friends that I trust, 
which made sense to me. If you don't lose oil pressure, you have enough lubricity in the oil to survive. Not long, but it beats towing the truck home. So I drove it from Pennsylvania out to here, very carefully monitoring the water level, oil level, and it used six gallons of oil along with the nine gallons of water, but it made it back. I then power washed the whole thing stem to stern, tried my best to get as clean as possible as I knew was probably gonna be a rebuild. And that again was right before Christmas time. I left the truck here. I had to schedule a trip to go back home to my family in New Jersey and Jen's home in Philadelphia. So if you don't mind, go ahead and hit that like button down there on the bottom. Hit a subscribe button up here too. And go ahead and check out the other videos. I promise you they're quite entertaining. Again, there's another side to my channel. Now with that being said, upon arriving back to Wisconsin, I had to find out what happened here. When I dumped the oil pan, I found out there wasn't a water puddle on the bottom of the oil. I'm not a science major here, and far as I know, water and oil, they don't mix. I don't know if it's a proper use of the word, but my father would say that his father, with either a Model A or a Model T back in the day, dealt with something similar, and he said it was like the water and oil would homogenize. The oil came out of this engine was thin, but there was no water and oil separation in the oil pan. Either way, obviously the water was going into the crankcase. There's no debate about that. Between the white slime and the thin oil, we knew what was happening. We just didn't know where. I was hoping for an air compressor. Sat here. I was hoping maybe a water pump. Couldn't figure it out. Took the oil pan off, filled it with antifreeze, pressurized the coolant system. I used the uh, I used radiator cap as a pressure relief. Popped off at 15 PSI. I actually put a brand new cap just to be on the safe side. And I couldn't find anything. I took the valve covers off, took the jakes off, cleaned up the top of it, pressure tested it, cleaned it up, pressure tested it. Three to four days of pressure testing and I couldn't get more than a half a shot glass of water out of this engine. The most water I found were literally drops. I mean, we're counting drops. I mean, I was seeing water droplets in my dreams, okay? And it was all seen me hovering around cylinder number three, but not on the liner down the block. Determined to not have this problem again, and despite the fact that I had just sunk a ton of money in this truck to get it running, I then opted to do a complete rebuild on the engine. Not just a basic in-frame, but also took the front cover off and replaced all the gaskets. I'm chasing all the oil leaks too. If I have it apart, I may as well do the full job. Now, Adept Ape has a lot of other videos, and there's a few other YouTubers out there, I'm sure, that have great videos regarding how to rebuild this entire engine. So there's no need to go back there for me. I'm not gonna film this whole process. But, on, but I've yet to find on YouTube a good video about this scary thing called liner projection and counter bore. Now, what is that? Well, as you can see, I already have it set up. I'll go ahead and go back and show you putting this rig together. But this is a basic way to do it. Now, understand, I bought the book for this engine. This engine is a 7FB. It's a 3406B, but the serial number starts 7FB. 7 Foxtrot Bravo. That'll give you Caterpillar purists an idea of what exactly I'm working on. Now, they have a very goofy kind of bridge set up that they use to sit over the liners and push them down. Later on in years, even Caterpillar doesn't do that. I spoke to Caterpillar, and, um, and Snap-on also has tools that could do the same job as well. But I'm not trying to buy another few thousand dollars worth of tools, believe it or not, to do this job. I'm already out a few thousand dollars, just in special tools here. So understand, this is not a uh, not an easy job, but if you ever think you're gonna do it again, or you wanna save yourself $15,000 in labor, and spend a lot of time, you can probably do this engine yourself, provided you have a good shop background. If you've never worked on engines before, this is not the job for you. But for the guys that do, that's what this video is for. Now Caterpillar no longer uses those big fancy tools to go on top of the cylinder liner and push them into the block. What the service department over at Caterpillar locally told me to do is this setup. He gave me right out of the Caterpillar book this method of how to do it. However, the part numbers were different. The bolts are different because apparently C15, C16 has a different thread pitch than 3406B in the head bolts. So a few things are different, but this is the basic idea. 
All you need is a dial indicator. I picked this up from Granger for like $70. In the end, all this job is to do, you're checking the height. You want this part of the liner to stick out a little bit above this here, which is your spacer plate. I'll go ahead and put video of me putting this together so you see exactly how it was done. And we'll go there and I'll show you what you're looking for and what is in and what is out of spec for Caterpillar per the book. Now I bought all new cylinder packs with this engine and I took the pistons out of the pack so I could do this job. Now what is cylinder liner projection and counterbore? The answer is this right here. Now remember this engine was already rebuilt once upon a time. So it's already been done, but I don't know how well it was done. And since I'm replacing the liners, this is the job I need to check. What happens over time, you see this liner's been pulled, but these two are still here. The liners in the flanges, where the liner sits on the block, the liner sinks into the block a little bit, and the mating surface between the head gasket and the liner no longer has a good contact, hence you have a head gasket failure. So what they do is they take a counter bore tool and they bore this ring out. Then they replace the material they remove from the block with this spacer. Now this has already been done in the past. Now this is not something that water would have chewed away like it did with the O-rings for the liners, which is why I think it failed. However, I do need to check it that these shims are the proper size and work with this job. So now you see what they do when they counter bore the block. I've never counterboard one before. It might be best that you have someone else do it, or maybe you do it yourself. You know what you're good at. Hopefully I won't have to do anything other than change these shims, if even that. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the liner in, and you'll see how the liner sits into this hole. I'm gonna go ahead and give the block one more wipe. Don't want any kind of debris sitting on top of that spacer and throw your measurements off. Okay, when you put your liner in, you don't put any O-rings in it yet. Reason for this is you're taking them back out. You don't want to ruin the O-rings. This is the flange right here that sits on the block that will over time punch into the block. Now again, stock blocks, you're not going to have these shims in here. Your counter bore will sink and you'll lose your head gasket. This was already done. Shim is installed. Now when you put the liner in, you don't put the O-rings in. Once the O-rings are in, as far as I know, that's it, they're done. So you do this test with the O-ring out. Also, you're not pushing down on the O-rings. The O-rings aren't returning the liner up higher, so you don't have to crank down on them as hard. So we're gonna go ahead and put the liner in directly. I just wanted you to see the flange and the space where the flange goes. There you go. It's pretty easy so far. Now note on this engine here, you have two alignment dowels for your head and two oil feed lines which go to your upper rocker arm assembly. Next you install your lower head gasket. There are O-rings that go between the spacer plate and your oil feed line. That's why they don't get real close to the oil feed lines. Next, you set your spacer plate on. Line them up with your alignment dowels, and there you go. Next, we put the bolts on top. Now, these bolts is where you can get in trouble. These bolts are just shorter head bolts. Same thread, same pitch, same everything. The first washer you put on, in this case, it's a standard head bolt, no big deal, nothing fancy. Now, the next washer is where it gets picky. This washer is mostly resin. It's not actually metal. You need 14 of them, at least on this engine you do. This is the bag they come in. There's your Caterpillar part number, 7 kilo 1977. They're like a really thick circuit card, for lack of a better term. So all you do is you set the washer on there like so. I put a little bit of oil on the threads of the bolt, and they thread down. Now look how close they are to that liner. When it seats down, it pushes down the spacer plate over here and pushes the liner 
by nipping just the edge of the liner. This way when you torque this down, it pushes the plate down and pushes the liners down at the same time. Now I'm going to go ahead and install the rest of the bolts. Please bear in mind, I failed to say this earlier, those resin washers have to be what's against your liners because if not, the washers, if you use the metal ones, will damage your liners. You don't want that, so you need to use those resin washers. According to the procedures on the Caterpillar paperwork, they say to torque this down to 10 foot-pounds. To me, that seems a little light. Also, the thread pitch is different between 3406B and what these procedures are, which is for C15. Again, I'm not by any means a Caterpillar professional. I don't really know what they would say, but since it's my engine, I've determined we'll test it at 20 foot pounds. Bear in mind, the head bolts are torqued to 330 when you're done. I already set my torque wrench down to 20 foot pounds, and I'm gonna do an interesting pattern, and you'll see why here in a moment. I mean, that's hardly any pressure. So we'll go back and forth this way. This way we set it down, I'll come back to get this way. Get the next liner, the next, the next, the next, and so on. And we'll come back and we'll start here. I mean, that's not much above hand tight. This is my Caterpillar service manual for 3406B. I'll read you directly from the book so you understand what ultimately we're trying to do here. Line of projection must be between one thousandths and six thousandths of an inch. That's between 0 .001 and 0 .006 inches. If you're in another country watching this video, Sorry, it's going to have to do the conversions. So again, line of projection must be from one thousandth of an inch to six thousandths of an inch. Measurements on the same liner must not be different by more than two thousandths. Average measurements between liners next to each other must not be different by more than two thousandths of an inch. If the liner projection is not one thousandths to six thousandths of an inch check the thickness check the thickness of the following parts spacer plate spacer plate gasket and cylinder liner flange the thickness of the spacer plate must be 338 thousandths plus or minus one thousand the thickness of the spacer plate gasket must be eight thousandths of an inch plus or minus one thousand the thickness of the cylinder liner flange must be 350 thousandths, or 0 0.350, plus or minus 8 ten thousandths, which is 0 0.0008. That's real tight tolerance. What that means is you have to have total projection of the liner sticking above the spacer plate, no more than six thousandths of an inch and no less than one thousandth of an inch and it can't be different between your four points you take which i'm going to do here 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 and here what you're checking for is your liner being crooked like so if you're more we'll read that again liner projection must be one thousandth to six thousandth of an inch measurements on the same liner must not be different by more than two thousandths. So if over here is four, you can be only down here to two or up to six, but no more. If you're seven, it's too much. The liner's cantilever. 
Now one way to change that is to loosen this and rotate the liner until all until it all works out well. Now, the other thing is you can't have one liner too high and one liner too low. Even if it's leveled off right, for lack of a better term, we're gonna call it level. So even if one liner is level properly, you can't have one liner too tall and level and another liner too low and level. Average measurements, now they're saying that average. Average measurements between liners next to each other must not be different by more than two thousandths of an inch. Well, basically what that's saying is, if you read it exact language, is you average each cylinder. Now Caterpillar has a form that they fill out and I guess they give to you when they do this job. Basically they have to cover their tail for warranty purposes. Obviously there's no warranty here, I'm doing the work. It's my engine. So what I'll do is I'll cheat and I'll write the numbers on the spacer plate. Now I'll go ahead and show you how I actually measure this out. I bought this tool from Granger. What I'll do is I'll set it right there and I'll give it some room to move around a little. Lock the magnet in place so it doesn't move. I'll measure this one here so you can see the dial. I'm not gonna bore you and have you watch every single one, but you'll see what the process is. I'm gonna head, let me zoom in on that dial so you see where it is and what I'm doing. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zero this out. Now you see, you touch it, the dial moves a little bit, but it comes right back. So we'll set it right at zero. Now each line on this is 1,000. Here is 10, so that would be 0 .010. So every line you see is a 1,000. So right there, sitting on that line or lip right here is zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it so it steps off the liner. Now you can see that reads, so now you see it reads two, so two thousandths. So this liner projects above that spacer plate two thousandths of an inch. Point zero zero two. I'll put an X where I actually checked it. Now let me read from the book. Liner projection must be 1,000th to 6,000th. That's 0 .001 to 0 .006. Measurements on the same liner. Measurements on the same liner must not be different by more than 2,000th of an inch. So this one we have 005, 003, that's two. 004-005, we're within. Number, number five, 004-002, that's right on it. 004-004, that's within tolerance. 
003, 002, 003, 003, within tolerance. 004, 002, right at it, 002, 002. I got one high spot right there, within tolerance. 002, 002, 003, 003. If anything, she's cocked that way, but by one thousandth, within tolerance. 002, 002, 00, 002, 002, 002, 002, 004. One oddball within tolerance. Now, let's read on. Average measurements between liners next to each other must not be different by more than two thousandths. That's the average. So here you have 0.0035 and 0.0025 for averages. The one thousandth off with intolerance. This one. 00275 and 0035. Again, with intolerance. 0025 and 00275. That's almost the same. 0025, 0025. Again, practically the same. 0025, 0025. The same. Notice they get a little taller as you go towards the back of the engine. It's curious. Let's read on. The maximum difference in the cylinder average projection for all the cylinder liners under one cylinder head must not be more than four thousandths. 0025, 00425. We don't have any of them that's different more than two thousandths of an inch. The widest split we have is here, number one, at 0025, and this one at 00425. The difference is two thousandths. But under one cylinder head, which is obviously on this B model Caterpillar, one head, it's not like a Cummins where it's three and three, it's just one head of, of six. The difference between this cylinder, the lowest, actually these three are the same, but the difference between this cylinder and this cylinder here is only two thousandths of an inch. You're allowed four. So we're well within spec. We don't have any cantilevered cylinders. We don't have one too high, one too low. And we don't have any neighboring cylinders greater than two thousandths of an inch. In fact, we're not even close to two thousandths of an inch. We're just a little over one. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that is excellent projection right there.